Hi, my name is Terry Rich. I'm an ornithologist and birder here in Boise, Idaho. I have put together a talk for the Deer Flat chapter of the Idaho Master Naturalists, a talk about birds. They're uh, master naturalists, or at least they want to be, so they're studying every sort of thing under the sun. Last week they learned about lichens. Steve Buffard gave a talk on the evolution of birds, feathers, and flight, so I'm not going to be covering that material, but I will be starting with some very basic information about birds, so I think this talk uh, hopefully will not only be useful to the master naturalist, but to anyone who wants to sort of get started in birds and birding. So the first part of this is sort of going to be birds 101, uh, what makes birds different from mammals and that sort of thing. I'll also talk about some fundamentals about birding, go over some migratory birds in Idaho in this section, and then, at, and then end up with some birding tools and tips. Uh, I'd like to thank Tom Carroll, who's behind the scenes here, uh, far, far away, as we're all social distancing, as we're supposed to. Uh, Tom's the, the man behind the Idaho Birding Facebook page, and he's recording this on Zoom from his home, and I'm in my home, so we're being uh, very healthy about all this. So I hope you uh, enjoy this, and if you have any questions, my email is at the very end of the talk, and you could, you're very welcome to send me a question or a comment or any kind of feedback that you care for. My uh, outline is here. I want to first, the point I always make in uh, giving talks about birds and especially identification is you don't have to become a, an expert at identifying birds. The main thing is to en enjoy them. And if you just want to go out in your yard and then listen to songs, and that may be a good enough for you if you want to get serious like I did in junior high and dedicated my whole life to birds and ornithology. And there are a lot of paths in between those two extremes. Uh, like I said, we'll spend a little bit of time on some fundamentals about birds, how they're different from mammals. Look at a uh, sampling of the migratory birds in Idaho. Spend a little bit of time on birding tools and tips on finding birds. Then go to specific clues on how to identify particular species by sight and by sound, and that's probably the most technical bit is talking about bird song. But uh, in all of these things, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, you can go as, as deep as you want to, or uh, basically as deep as you want to. You don't have to get real serious about this stuff. And a lot of things I'm presenting um, are not, it's not something you're going to be tested on, right? You don't have to memorize it, but it gives you an idea of the, all the things that maybe a professional, a real serious bird or a professional ornithologist looks at and thinks about. I always like to finish up with a little bit on bird conservation. A lot of species are declining, so it's good to cover some of those causes and give you some ideas of what you can do. And then finally, uh, lots more information that we can't go into here uh, websites and other uh, sources of information that you can uh, take uh, take home and and check out as you wish. So birds are beautiful. That's step number one, and that's probably why a lot of us get involved in it and even end up spending our dedicating our lives to birds. Some of the uh, most beautiful birds in North America occur, occur right here in Idaho and right here in Boise. A lot of these species. Um, are not here just yet. They're still south of here. They'll be coming through in late April and particularly in May as they migrate north from Mexico, <clears throat> excuse me, Central America and other points to the south. And we'll go over some of these a little bit later in a little bit of detail. You can bird uh, anywhere and everywhere. Anytime you're outside, you don't have to always have binoculars and be looking for things. When I ride my bike, when I'm working in the yard, certainly when I'm walking my dog, I am always listening and, and also watching. You can't always tell what everything is if you don't have binoculars, but you certainly can listen and just be aware of the birds around you. So I think that's, that's a nice place to start. And then you get used to uh, those more common birds that you hear every time you go out the door, you hear that bird, and then you hopefully learn what it is, and, uh, and, that's, and then you're on your way. So some fundamentals about birds. Uh, there was a, a presentation from the Master Naturalist a few days ago by Steve Buffard, who spent quite a bit of time on the evolution of birds and the evolution of feathers and the evolution of flight. That, uh, so I'm not going to cover that stuff for this particular audience. Uh, but 
what makes a bird a bird? Well, the number one thing is feathers. It's a defining characteristic of the vertebrate, vertebrate class aves. Um, feathers are found in every species of bird, every living species, and uh, no other uh, vertebrate has, has uh, feathers. Um, all birds have wings. Obviously, all birds don't fly. All birds have beaks made of a bony core and a thin layer of keratin. They do not have true teeth, also, although sometimes the bills of some birds have notches that function somewhat as teeth do. And uh, finally, all species lay eggs. Now, most species that fly have, uh, they're famous for their hollow bones that uh, you know, provide very lightweight structure so they can get off the ground. Uh, birds that don't fly like ostriches and uh, a number of other species, emus, have much denser bones, more like mammal bones. There are, according to Birds of the World online, I just looked this up last night, 10,721 species are described in that uh, source of information. I'll go, I'll go into that in a little more detail later. Uh, and you can see the other numbers there, mammals, about 5,500, reptiles, 82, some amphibians, 6,500. And um, only fish outnumber birds. They do it by quite a, quite a long shot, as you can see, almost 32,000 species of fish. Now, one thing about birds that uh, fish cannot claim is that birds occur in basically every habitat on Earth. They're, uh, you know, in the deserts, they're in the Arctic, they're in the Antarctic, they're out way out on the ocean. They're everywhere except the deep sea. You know, they're not diving a mile underneath the ocean with whales, but they're uh, in, the, in the surface of the sea and certainly over the sea all over the world. This uh, is really a superb example of adaptive radiation. The, the species have gone into all these different habitats, and we'll look a little bit at some of the adaptations that allow them to exploit every, basically everything. Uh, 1,200 species roughly are threatened with extinction, uh, so that's something like 10%. That's one thing. One reason I always talk about conservation is we have a lot of really serious conservation issues with bird population declines, and there's a few things that everybody can do right in their own home property, so it's good to know about those. We'll touch on those. And then finally, uh, because these birds are out there everywhere, and because um, they're out during the day, they're singing their names, they're flying around, the mo many of them are very colorful. They're, they're very good indicators of the environment and you might contrast that with uh, mammals, which are, a lot of mammals are nocturnal or they're sneaking around under the, under the vegetation and they're very hard to see, they don't make any sound. So if you want to figure out what the world is doing according to mammals, you, you have to go to a lot of work to find these mammals, identify them. And, and so on. The birds are just kind of out there saying, hey, here I am or here I'm not. And uh, much easier, much easier than fish, obviously. Uh, reptiles and amphibians, some amphibians make a lot of, you know, they say their names, they peep and croak. Uh, but again, a lot of them are uh, pretty quiet or they're under the water or they're only in water. So they don't help with dry habitat. So birds are really by far the best indicators of what's going on on the planet. As I said, birds occur in every habitat but the deep sea, from uh, the Sahara Desert there are birds, <laughs> unbelievably. And of course, the Arctic and Antarctic have birds. One uh, quick way to sort of look at this incredible uh, adaptive radiation across the planet is simply to look at the shapes of bird beaks and the types of foraging behaviors they uh, have. One of the uh, most common behaviors is simply called gleaning like this orange crowned warbler you see here. These are, this is when a bird just tops around on the branches and is looking, peering under leaves, over leaves, into little cavities, and basically just looking everywhere it can to find uh, a caterpillar or some insect eggs or a spider or some other bug, typically trying to hide from being predated by a bird. So these birds, if you watch them during the day, they're pretty much constantly looking for food. It's, that's 20, well, I won't say 24 seven, they sleep at night, but during the day, they are just, they're going full time looking for food. Probing is, a, uh, is another really big uh, effort. And you can see, especially by the spectral sandpiper, a lot of shorebirds are probing into the mud and into the sand under the water. They can't see what's down there, but they, so they rapidly check 
with their bills and when they hit something, presumably most of that stuff is edible to a sandpiper and they hit something and they gobble it up. There are a lot of birds on land that probe and my favorite prober that I've ever seen myself is this Akiapolaau from Hawaii. You can see the incredible uh, beak that's so different from top to bottom and they, they forage with their mouths open like that. It gives you a jaw ache to think about it. They, they go around poking and probing with that little sharp woodpecker-like beak and then if they find some insect that's a little too deep for that bill, they can hook it out with that upper bill. So really highly specialized and a spectacular prober. That's on the big island of Hawaii, by the way. Uh, drilling, of course, woodpeckers are famous for drilling. They, uh, you know, work the bark, you know, go into the bark a ways, drilling little holes. They, they peel bark off by flipping it off to see if there are things hiding underneath. So big specialists uh, using the drilling approach. Fly catching um, is another very widespread activity, and I was uh, surprised at how hard it was to find a good picture of fly catching on the web. So I thank um, Brian through uh, Tom Carroll, who who sent this photo just just this morning of this violet green swallow uh, grabbing or about to grab a little gnat of some kind. So. Uh, challenge to all photographers, see if you can get some more pictures of birds fly catching. Uh, obviously, it's pretty tricky or they'd be on the web already. So these birds, uh, like swallows and night jars, that is uh, night hawks, swifts, fly around continually grabbing bugs out of the air, but a lot of birds use a sit and wait approach to fly catching. A lot of tropical birds, olive sided fly catcher, a lot of our fly catchers sit in an open spot. Lewis's woodpeckers do this sit in an open spot and just watch for something to fly over. And you can see them looking around. They just literally look around and they, they spot things that I certainly can't see and they'll launch off their perch and go grab it. Nectar feeding, of course, is uh, that's what how hummingbirds make a living. Mostly they do eat a lot of bugs too, but they're visiting flowers and getting uh, the sugar, uh, sugary nectar out of the flowers to power their, their flight. Uh, of interest, I think, is uh, this group of birds in South America, the cinnamon or the flower piercers of several species. And if you can see this bird, he's actually going into the base of the and punting a hole to get to the nectar. So they're basically stealing the nectar. They're not pollinating the flowers like the hummingbirds do. So they're really uh, nectar thieves, but that's another way uh, to make a living. The uh, sap suckers are a really fascinating group. We've got these four species in North America. Red naped is the one we have around Boise most commonly. Uh, Williamson's are up higher in the, in the mountains, yellow belly in the east and red breasted more on the west coast. But what these guys do is drill little pits into the bark of trees and then when the sap, then they'll, they'll do that and then come back maybe even an hour later, maybe certainly a day later, they'll keep coming by and lick out the sap that pools into these little wounds that they've made. There are also insects attracted to this sap and they'll get stuck in there. And so the sap suckers also can, can gobble up the uh, insects that might get stuck. So really interesting um, strategy for getting your food. Again, showing just the incredible amount, uh, amount of variety and the diversity in the way birds have figured out how to exploit this world and make a living. Predation obviously is a big factor. I mean, there are, I don't know how many hundreds of species of, of raptors who are eating other birds, eating other mammals, eating lizards. Um, a lot of raptors are actually insect eaters. They'll grab big moths and beetles flying in the sky, uh, especially smaller things like kestrels. We'll eat quite a few insects actually, but these are all, um, predators are all preying on other animals. Seed eating is maybe, I'd have to look at all the numbers, it may be the most successful strategy of all. There are just an enormous number of small, mostly smaller birds that make a living eating seeds of all sorts all over the planet. Uh, Crossbills are obviously quite highly specialized to open certain cones with this, with this odd crossed bill. Uh, most seed eating birds are, are more like this pine grosbeak. They just have a, a rather big, heavy bill that's built for uh, crushing seeds of various sizes. Fishing has been a very successful strategy. There are many, many, many species of kingfishers 
particularly in the old world, we only have five in the Western Hemisphere, but there are at least many dozens in the old world. A lot of the birds that are out on the ocean, like these Australasian gannets, make a living by fishing. And you can see a spectacular photo of those two birds in the back just getting ready to go into the water like rockets. And they will swim under the water and actually chase fish. So uh, a lot of the oceanic species make a living by, by grabbing those 32,000 species of fish that are out there. Scavenging um, is, is a big success story for vultures. Uh, curious that not that many species have actually adapted, uh, picked this up as a way to make a living. Turkey vulture um, being the most well-known, we'll come back to vultures in a second. Um, I'm not going to go into feet, but you get this. You can kind of tell some of the same stories or slightly different stories by looking at the feet of birds and the tremendous degree of adaptation from those uh, that are webbed so they can swim well, those that are powerful and clawed like an eagle's feet so they can uh, grab their prey and even uh, kill their prey, and then uh, sort of everything in between. Hummingbirds, for example, have feet that are of no use except to perch. They can't walk or do anything else with their feet. All they can do is hold on to a little perch. Of course, when you can fly backwards, you know, I wouldn't walk either. I'm, I'm always amazed at how many different shapes of wings work for different species of birds. And this is just, just a few pictures of uh, short and fat wings and long wings that are straight, long wings that are scimitar shaped. The drawing on the right shows some of the basic sort of structures. If you look at uh, that top bird, that's a gliding bird. That's not soaring, that's gliding. So that's like an albatross. They have these huge long wings that are relatively stiff and they literally can glide on ocean winds for days on end without landing or even flapping, they just glide. Soaring birds, we're used to our red-tailed hawks most commonly around here, and, and eagles if you get out in the country a little bit, picking up uh, thermal uplifts and using their relatively broad deep wings just to float up on the breeze and to not have to fly so much. Birds that have a uh, ability to, for a rapid takeoff tend to have very deep and relatively short wings. And think of if you've ever been uh, startled by a grouse or a quail exploding out of the brush underneath your feet and you didn't even see it and all of a sudden bang, gives you a heart attack. Uh, they have these very uh, fat, short wings with a lot of power. They can't go very far, they can't soar, they're not big flyers, but they can get off the ground and get out fast and then go down again somewhere else. The uh, really high speed flyers are shown uh, by the swift wing. There are lots of species of swifts around the world and they have this very stiff, fairly narrow wing and they can just jet around in the wind, literally like little jets. And if you ever watch white-throated swifts in the canyon country, uh, mostly south of here, getting down to Utah and Arizona, get on a cliff top and just watch these white-throated swifts shoot around. It's amazing how fast they can go. And then, of course, we already talked a little bit about hummingbirds. Uh, and not so much the wing shape, but the the muscles and the skeletal structures allowing them to flip their wings again so they can fly backwards. So that's uh, just a quick look at the tremendous variety and all these wings work, you know, for the species, for what they do. That's what I find really interesting. We can also look at the array of sizes that occur in birds. Here's uh, the smallest bird in the world, uh, the bee hummingbird. 0 0.06 ounces, you know, it's, that's about as close to weightless as you can get, I think. Uh, literally, literally the size of a bee. The largest flying bird is the quarry bustard of Africa at 42 pounds. And then um, the largest living bird now is a common ostrich, which is apparently the biggest one of those they've ever weighed. Got onto a bathroom scale somewhere, uh, 346 pounds. So, I mean, the again, the the tremendous variety and sizes just shows, again, how much evolutionary variation there has been in this, this group of animals. The vision of some birds is legendary. Uh, golden eagles can see a jackrabbit uh, a mile away, or another analogy is they could read the headlines in the newspaper at the length of a football field. Also notice that they're their eyes are right in the front of their head. They have binocular vision like we do. 
So they're very, very keenly available, sorry, very keenly uh, able to see something right ahead of them at a long distance at great detail. Uh, contrast that with this American woodcock. You notice how the eyes are on the side of its head. This bird spent its time on the forest floor probing around for earthworms and uh, insects and little mollusks and other things in the leaf litter and in the soil. So he's got his head down probing around with his beak and he wants to see, he or she wants to see if there's anything coming in from on high, some hawk coming out of the woods, some goshawk. So his eyes are on the side of the head and he's looking, he can see all the way around his head. He doesn't need binocular vision, he just needs to detect motion so that if something's coming after him, he can get out of there. Uh, that face may look familiar, the same strategy on prairie dogs and ground squirrels, eyes on the side of the head with a tremendous ability to see around themselves, in this case for maybe a prairie falcon coming in on them. Hearing has been studied uh, quite a bit, especially in barn owls, but owls in general, because they're, uh, you know, they're quite fascinating to us, their ability to uh, hear and locate mammals in pitch darkness, and also they can locate animals under a couple feet of snow and go straight into the snow and grab that, that mouse that's screwing around under there. Uh, they do that using a couple of different tools. You can see the facial discs on, on the great gray and the barn owl here that sort of capture or reflect the sound in, in right into their facial area. You'll see that uh, owls that are active during the day, like burrowing owls, don't have this kind of a facial disc. They're relying much more on sight. And if you look at the drawing in the middle, we know that the owl's ears are also the ones that examined are also asymmetrical. So when, that, when the sound comes in, it not only hits the left and right ear at a different time, but because one is slightly higher than the other, it also arrive, they can also get information from that. That allows them to pinpoint the location of that prey item quite precisely. And lots of experiments have shown that they can, they can get exactly on a prey item with, with no visual cues whatsoever. Most birds, we think, can not smell anything. They have no need to smell. They're, as I said, very visual mostly. And so smelling is not, uh, not important to them. And their, their brains are not, um, they don't occupy or, or sacrifice any space to worrying about smelling things. Of course, a big uh, exception to this are the vultures, the 23 species of vultures. The, uh, our turkey vulture is actually the most widely spread vulture in the world. Most of the others are in the old world. And it also has the largest uh, part of its brain devoted to smelling of uh, birds examined so far. So that's, a, that's a, a serious business for them, and they can smell um, rotting meat at least a mile away, uh, prob probably farther than that if the wind is bringing those molecules to their receptors. One uh, other thing that's fascinated me, and I, I don't have a good grasp on it yet, uh, is the, 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 how sexual selection operates in different species. Now, the, probably the most spectacular example of sexual selection is in the uh, Indian peafowl, or our commonly known as peacock. Uh, sexual selection is what happens to males over time in evolution when females are choosing what's going on. So female peacocks for thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years have said, I like brighter, I like bigger, I like fancier. And this is what you get from female uh, selection by female peacocks. You get this incredibly bizarre um, bird with color and pattern. And this is not particularly easy for this male to haul all this tail around either. You know, the tigers eat these things. And when you've got a tail this big that weighs that much, you know, you're, you're going to have trouble getting away from some predators. So it's costly for the males. But from an evolutionary perspective, if you don't have a fancier tail than your neighbor, you know, you're not going to get any, any females and you're not going to have any young. What's, what's fascinating to me is if you look at this bird on the right, the dwarf tyrant mannequin of the, of the Amazon, this bird's about the size of a kinglet, and it's up in the canopy, and it's about as plain as a bird could be, right? It's olive from top to bottom. It's got no, doesn't even have a wing bar, really, or an eye ring or anything. It's just a drab little bird, and yet 
dwarf tyrant mannequins have also been successful. The females have selected this. This is what they've chosen. And this bird has not evolved anything like a peacock has evolved. And yet they're apparently both successful. They both exist to this day and they're both in reasonable numbers. So both strategies work. And again, it fascinates me how sexual selection can run crazy in some species and in others. It doesn't seem to be a factor. We can uh, see the same thing in song. And this uh, superb lyre bird on the right, on the left, you may have seen, uh, if you watch David Attenborough's uh, Life of Birds, this is a very famous bird that can do all kinds of crazy vocals. And let's see if we can uh, hear some of the stuff that this bird does in the jungle. So he will go on like that literally for many minutes and uh, spectacular ability to do all kinds of sounds, including imitating mechanical sounds. You can see that he's got some tail feathers too. So the female has chosen, has driven this bird not only to have pretty fancy tail, even though his body's all black or essentially so, uh, but also the vocals have gone crazy. Uh, okay, now contrast, we can use the same bird, the dwarf tyrant mannequin, to hear what vocals this bird has. Here we go. So this bird has got that little two note deer deek and that's it. Again, the mannequin has been perfectly successful with this little simple little call while this lyre bird has this crazy ability to uh, do all sorts of things. Now, I should say that the lyre bird can learn its songs. Many birds can learn. Many birds cannot learn. They're born with their song. And the dwarf tyrant mannequin um, is born with its song. So they all are going to sound about the same. And that's, that's what they do. Um, if you want to have some fun, go to YouTube and search for superb lyre bird. And you will hear some really crazy stuff, especially look at David Attenborough's uh, bit on lyre birds. So let's look at uh, migratory birds in Idaho. This is the way I structure my uh, talks at the Foothills Learning Center in uh, Boise that I give on the first Wednesday of each month. Uh, grouping the birds, you can group birds in all kinds of different ways, but I group them this, this way, which gives it more of a seasonal um, focus. We have breeding birds that leave, that breed here, nest here, raise their young, and then leave for the winter. We have birds that breed north of Idaho and just pass through in the spring and fall. They don't spend too much time here. We'll look at a few of those. There, there's a group of birds that breed north of Idaho. By north, I mean up into Canada, up into the Arctic, and then spend the winter here. They don't go farther south into Latin America. Uh, we have altitudinal migrants. These are species that are breeding up in the forests, you know, around Bogus Basin, McCall, Stanley. And in the winter, they just come down off the mountain into the valleys. They don't necessarily need to go south, but they gotta get out of those high elevations because they can't stay there. There's no food for most of them. There's a group of residents that just live here all year round. And then a small group that I call partial migrants. And so we'll look just a few of each of these, these groups just to kind of give you a flavor. As I said, um, a lot of the birds in Idaho, the altitudinal migrants in particular, but also some of the others, They've got to leave because the food they're eating is just simply not there in the winter. Not too many species can survive in this setting, although some can. Mountain chickadees, ravens, uh, pine grosbeaks are in this picture right here. I ski, and so I, I see them up there. Blue grouse or dusky grouse are up there as well. But most birds can't make a living in these conditions, so they leave. So, um, sorry, breeding birds that um, leave in the winter. Oh, sorry, going the wrong way. Breeding birds that leave in the winter. Uh, just, a, again, a few examples so you get a sense for this. So one of them is black-chinned hummingbird. Uh, the maps that I've got from, uh, from Cornell, from either All About Birds or Birds of the World, each of these maps is about the same. The, the breeding range is shown as orange. If there's a known migration uh, range, that's in yellow. Areas that might be non-breeding, and that's the wintering area, is in blue. 
And then if there's some area where they're, where they're actually resident, that will show in purple. So this is actually a good example that shows you that whether a bird is a migrant or not really depends on where you are. So they have different behaviors in different areas. And this is not unusual at all. So you can see black chins breed across the West. They migrate into uh, Western Mexico. And you, if you want to see them in the winter, a fairly small region, you go down into the states of Nayarit and Colima, Jalisco, Michoacan, and that's where you'll find black chinned hummingbirds, along with a bunch of Mexican hummingbirds, I might add. It's a good place to go in the winter to see all kinds of hummingbirds. The yellow warbler is a really widespread uh, bird, as you can see. This is one of the newer maps from Cornell based on eBird data. So eBird, which I will talk about quite a bit later in this talk, uh, is providing phenomenal data to give us ever more detailed pictures of where these birds are. So here's a big red range map showing yellow warblers from you know, Newfoundland to the Aleutians all the way across the West. But what I wanted to show here, notice that they migrate through the Southern US and pretty much completely out. Looks like there's a few wintering in Florida, but mostly they're in Mexico and then clear down into Central America. And in fact, into Venezuela, Colombia, and perhaps even a little bit into uh, Ecuador and some of the other adjacent countries down there. So they move quite a long way in the winter. Another favorite around here, the one bird that will eat grape jelly out of a jar lid on your, on your patio railing, if you want to put some out, Bullock's Oriole. Again, widespread breeder across the West, migrates completely out of the US into Mexico. And if you look at the Mexican range, uh, if you know Mexico at all, you'll see that in the eastern part, they're running up and down the, uh, the Cordillera Oriental in the east and then the western mountains and down in the coast, um, down into the very southern part of Mexico and Chiapas. One of my favorite birds is the barn swallow, a tremendous range. They're actually all around the world. They're in the old world as well. But our birds, you can see, breed fairly high into Canada and then winter way out of town. They leave, uh, looks like there's a few in Florida, maybe the Yucatan, a little bit in uh, Nicaragua. But these birds are mostly going all the way into South America and well into South America. They go about as far as any, any of our migratory species. One thing they figured out about these barn swallows is that some of them decided to stay in South America when spring rolled around, instead of flying all the way back to uh, you know Alberta or Idaho, stay in South America, nest there. And these birds now have become austro migrants. So birds that uh, you know nest in the very extreme southern part of South America also experience winter and also have to, many of them leave. And in their case, they're flying north and they're flying toward the Amazon, toward the equator. And these are austral migrants. Uh, so I think this, this is a really beautiful example of a super flexible bird that some of which completely changed their, their breeding and migratory strategies and uh, are probably undoubtedly doing fine. <clears throat> Birds that breed north of Idaho uh, and migrate through to the south. We don't have so many of these. Uh, probably the best example is a snow goose. They've been uh, in numbers out at the Fort Boise uh, wildlife management area and probably mostly leaving now, but you can see the orange breeding ranges. They're way, way up in the high Arctic and just a few spots, relatively small distribution in the breeding range. Uh, and then migrating through a huge part of North America, all that yellow to winter in uh, various places along the West Coast, Central Valley, uh, Southern Mississippi Valley, uh, Southern Great Plains. You can see the various areas, even some on the Atlantic coast. So this is, this is, again, is a good example of birds that mostly blow through Idaho spring and fall and don't really, uh, although they stop here for a little while, mostly um, they're not here most of the year. Most of the shorebirds are in this category, and I show you here the black-bellied plover, similar kind of breeding distribution as the snow goose, just those small bits along the high Arctic, along the coasts, and really not spending much time at all in the continental U.S. You can see a few in the Central Valley in winter, but mostly going into the Caribbean. So if we see these around Idaho, they're just going to come through for a week in the spring and a week in the fall. Common tern, similar sort of pattern, uh, much more widespread breeder, as you can see across boreal forests where there are wetlands, but also uh, mostly crossing the U.S. to the south 
to winter along uh, the Gulf Coast and then across the uh, coast of Mexico, Pacific coast of Mexico and Central America. There are uh, quite a few species, some of our favorites, that breed north of Idaho but spend the winter here, so they don't feel like they need to go too much farther. Idaho is relatively balmy compared to where they're breeding. Uh, one of the best known is the rough-legged hawk, high arctic tundra breeder. You see the breeding range. Pretty much leaves Canada and then comes in winters across the U.S. And they're across, uh, particularly out on the Snake River Plain. We don't see them around towns much or in the valley. They'll be out on the plains hunting uh, ground squirrels or rabbits or other uh, mammals generally out there. Northern shrike, we have, uh, of course, loggerhead shrikes breeding in the sagebrush country, especially around here. And in the winter, we actually have both. So these northern shrikes, much like uh, rough legs, are up in the tundra and taiga, and they need to move south a little bit, not as far as these other birds. You can see quite a few of them in the winter uh, well into Canada. But they do get down in here in the winter, and if you're out in the winter looking at birds, you want to you know, look at northern and loggerhead shrikes and see if you can figure out which is which. I'll give you some websites where, where they will help walk you through those, those field marks. The rosy finches are just an amazingly cool group of birds. They're uh, up in the Arctic tundra, up in the uh, alpine tundra. If you're a backpacker and you go up above tree line in the Rockies, you can run into rosy finches. Um, not this species, but more black rosy finches around here. But these birds are kind of similar. You can see this one breeding way out into the Pribilofs, actually a resident in the Pribilofs, breeding across much of uh, the Canadian Rockies and Alaska, and then coming down into our part of the world for the winter. You can see uh, some year-round um, polygons there, and that's the high mountain areas where they, uh, again, if you're backpacking and you go up above tree line in these, these parts of the Rockies, the Blue Mountains, and the uh, Montana border, you can see great crown rosy finches breeding up there. We're more likely to see them in flocks in the winter. They like south slopes. You can see them around the foothills of Boise and then uh, way out into the, uh, the Owyhee uplands uh, where there are uh, uh, some areas with no snow and they're in numbers. I think they had a flock of 300 some this year on the Bruno Christmas count. A real favorite of birders around here in the winter is the snow bunting. Uh, similar to the other birds, you can see the breeding distribution there and the migration uh, uh, patterns. Willing to winter fairly far north in Canada, but again, we get them in the winter. A good spot to find these guys is the road from uh, the road from Mountain Home to uh, Fairfield. As you get up into the Camas Prairie, that's a place where you'll start seeing snow buntings, uh, most more predictably in this part of the world. As I said, we have a number of birds that are altitudinal migrants, and a lot of these birds end up being our feeder birds. They're breeding up in the forest during the summer. In the fall, they start moving down slope. They can't handle the winters. The number one uh, bird in this category is the dark-eyed junco. This is also Idaho's number one feeder bird, according to Project Feeder Watch. Year after year after year after year, it's always juncos. Um, so, these guys are seed eaters, they're on the ground, and obviously once you start getting snow, they're out of luck. They have got to get out of the mountains and get to an area where they can have access to the ground and find seeds, and they love sunflower seeds. And again, they're big number one feeder bird in Idaho every year. You can see the breeding, uh, breeding range, tremendous breeding range, and this is one where the, the purple year-round range, again, is very, is very much about elevation. Uh, it looks like they're everywhere in Idaho all year, but that's not the case. They're moving up and down. I think eBird will probably get to an elevational breeding range map as well, so we can turn this on its uh, turn this map on its side and look at elevational bands of wintering and residency, etc. Pine siskin, a real favorite as well. Big thistle eater, same kind of pattern uh, as uh, dark eyed junco, coming down and uh, hitting the the feeders in the winter time. It's interesting because since they mostly are feeding up in the trees, it's interesting that they uh, have to leave whatever all food they're getting at high elevation is not is not sufficient. That can't hang around like mountain chickadees do. One of our 
really super cool predators that comes into the valley in the winter. You can see the uh, that these birds are resident in part of the northern Rockies and the Montana border, but mostly they're up farther in the boreal forest and they come down uh, south pretty much getting out of, uh, except for coastal Canada, getting out of Canada a little bit in the northern plains, coming way down uh, across the western U.S. into Central America, Mexico, the Caribbean. And you'll see um, this guy around Boise, he's around the Treasure Valley in the winter, but he's really a very fast flyer. He doesn't hover. He doesn't sort of hang around like kestrels do. So you're not as apt to see him unless you're really watching uh, for Merlins. White-crowned sparrows, another uh, favorite of backpackers. Once you get to uh, higher elevations and tree line, you'll find white-crowned sparrows breeding. Also all across the northern Arctic, across the tundra, coming down the Canadian Rockies. And once more, uh, resident in Idaho, but only in the sense that they're, they're resident at high elevations in the summer and lower elevations during the winter. So that's a sample of some of those guys. Let's look at a few of the residents. Uh, the number one resident is the house finch. So this bird is usually number two on feeders in the winter. Sometimes it drops to three, but it's usually sitting right at number two. On the other hand, as far as year round goes, any day you go out your door in the Treasure Valley, any month, any day, this is the most common bird encountered. This is the most common bird reported in the bird house finches. And of course, the male has this beautiful uh, red color, although it can vary a lot. And then the female with real heavy streaks, plain brown. And you can see they're resident across a huge part of the US and also a large part of Mexico. So they're ha they can make a living in our neighborhood. They certainly do in my yard. They're there every day and they don't need to go anywhere. American goldfinch, they're starting to show up in my area right now. And it is, I lost track of the date, April, 10th or so, 11th maybe. Um, these guys are starting to move in around here. You can see they're, they're resident around um, all through Idaho, but they have a lot of movements. And sometimes you see a lot of them in the winter and sometimes not so many. They're maybe a little more on the eruptive side, but uh, we should be able to see them uh, in the breeding season. And, and of course they like thistles, seeds and come to the feeders as well. Northern Flicker, and here's another one of the new uh, maps from Cornell based on eBird data. Interesting distribution for these guys. You can see they're, again, a tremendously wide breeding range coming all the way down through the Rockies into uh, southern Colorado, then resident over a good part of the country. They're certainly resident in my neighborhood. I can see them almost every day I go out the door, and they're shown as resident, as you can see, from most of Idaho. Um, also, wintering down into the southern U.S. for those birds that move. It's an interesting pattern because there's so many resident species. If you look at a good part of Mexico, we've got resident flickers, so that's pretty interesting. Black-capped chickadee, another resident. These guys are, uh, are able to make a living in my yard, my neighborhood, around the valley. Uh, all year round, you can see and hear chickadees. Black Bill Magpie, similar, a uh, little bit of non breeding range where they move out of the northern prairies, move out of the central prairies, but most of these birds are uh, just staying put and don't seem to have any need to move somewhere else during the winter. Finally, a, uh, just a couple of species of what I call partial migrants. Um, the best example is uh, the American robin, at least around here. From winter to winter, you just don't know if you're, you might have a lot of robins or you might hardly have a robin anywhere. It's a really interesting look at the Christmas bird count data. They just, they go from lots to none to lots to none. So really dynamic wintering. According to the map, of course, it looks like they're uh, residents here in most of Southern Idaho. And yeah, you could probably find a robin any day you went out if you looked around for a while, but the numbers vary enormously. And of course they switch to fruit in the winter. They love uh, earthworms in the summer, hopping around on our lawns, but in the winter, they switch to fruit, they flock up, and probably a lot of the dynamics of the robins is driven by where is the food. They'll eat juniper berries, mountain ash, they love choke cherries, and you'll see a big flock sweep into a, a tree and strip all the berries out, much like waxwings do, in maybe a matter of minutes. So probably fruit dynamics driving where you see robins. Um, morning doves are in a similar boat, at least in this part of the world. You can see 
on the map, they're shown as residents right here in the Treasure Valley, a little purple dot, but as mostly leaving, that is breeding, but leaving uh, most of the West. You can see the breeding range there, uh, most of that range. But here, again, some years you may have a lot of morning doves and some years hardly any. My hunting friends have always said that uh, as soon as hunting season opens, the morning doves, you know, the morning doves leave the day before hunting season opens. So I don't know if that's true. So uh, let's move on to birding tools and tips. And then I think we'll probably take a break maybe after this section. Of course, uh, field guides have been the classic tool for most birders forever. Uh, you know, when I was in junior high, there certainly was no such thing as a cell phone or a app or the internet or a computer or any of that stuff. Uh, field guides remain very, very popular among birders. Uh, some research I've been doing for my PhD shows that that books are second only to the internet, even to this day, as a source of information. And I think by most of these books are field guides. So my favorite is the National Geographic Field Guide. You can see with the eagle on it there, it's in its seventh edition. And uh, it's now covering 1,023 species. The, now that's a lot of birds. And beginners, I'll give you an option for beginners who may if you find that absolutely overwhelming all the birds of North America, including stuff that doesn't show up very often. Uh, the Middle Bird by Sibley. Sibley's got guides that are broken down geographically. So his guide to the West is a nice, um, a little smaller, more focused book. I think there's still over 600 species in there. Uh, but very nice, very popular guide. I point out Ken Kaufman's guide as another option, and particularly because he has produced it in Spanish. So for Spanish speakers out there, if you've got uh, Spanish-speaking friends who need a a surprise uh, Christmas gift or what's coming up, Easter bunny gift. Uh, Ken's Spanish guide is a really nice tool. For those of you who don't want to deal with so many species, the uh, we produced this guide uh, a few years ago, the field guide to Boise's birds. It's got the 99 most common species that are apt to be found in the parks and along the Boise River primarily, along the Greenbelt, those sorts of birds. Uh, as such, it's also going to be pretty useful for Napa, Caldwell, and on down the river. We're also, uh, they also produce a guide now for Idaho Falls, and we're working on Pocatello and Twin Falls as well. But here, here, so this is a much smaller uh, group of birds that you can look through, and this guide is also pocket size. It literally will fit into a shirt pocket. This app, another fabulous tool from Cornell, is the Merlin bird app it's free for uh, Android or iPhone and you put it right on your phone and while you're out there looking at a bird while you're sitting in your lawn chair you can see if you can figure out what it is and it just asks you five questions um, the first one is where did you see the bird of course if you have your uh, geolocation turned on your phone knows exactly where you are and uh, if, if you don't like that, you might want to turn that feature off. I like it. I, it knows where I am, and I just put current location. It says, when did you see the bird? Your phone knows, of course, what the date and time is, and you can just say, now. So then you're on to the third question, which is, what size? So you can pick a size between a, a goldfinch and a goose. The fourth question is, what were the main colors? And you can pick up to three different uh, colors to put in there, or you can just pick one. It's all black, like a crow. And then finally, what was it doing? And uh, I like this last question because it shows you how important a bird's behavior is to figure out what it is. Uh, you know, you're not gonna have a mallard climbing up a tree trunk, and you're not gonna have a nuthatch uh, swimming across a lake. So these simple uh, clues of behavior really help you out. When I was doing this just for fun, sitting in my chair here, I was thinking of this bird, and I put in its size about like a robin. Colors, three. I put in three colors, buffy, gray, and white. And um, what was it doing? It was sitting in a bush. And sure enough, Townsend Solitaire came up. Now, if, you, if that's your bird, you say, this is my bird. And then it'll say, congratulations. And you can go and look at some more information about it. If it's not your bird, it'll give you some other pictures and say, hey, was it this, was it this, was it this? And no matter how you answer it, eBird, uh, that is Merlin Cornell, takes this information and improves the app. So it's always getting better. One of my uh, go-to 
at, um, applications, uh, services for every sort of thing is eBird. It's, uh, it's, it's very diverse and very complex, and I'm not going to go into it anymore right here due to time, but I will point out that on uh, my YouTube channel, Bird Talk with Terry Rich, where this talk will live, hopefully, I have a whole session on eBird that I gave a couple of years ago. That's about an uh, hour and 24 minutes, so that gives you an idea, and I didn't go into all the features even then. That gives you an idea of, of all the things you can learn and the things you can do with eBird.